so awesome. Everybody here, can you hear me? I just want to tell you that today you are in for a very special, special treat. We, uh, last night, we became family. Yaden Haruza got married to Natasha Wallace, which is our um, Jeff and Teresa. Why don't you guys go ahead and stand up? Let's just give them a big welcome. Everybody stand and, as they come up here. You guys, go ahead and come on up. Woo! They are incredible. And I just wanted to tell them how much our family has already fallen in love with these people. They're beautiful people. And I know that when Pastor Jeff is preaching this morning, he's going to preach on a subject that we're all in. It's transition. And so, uh, you know, people preach better when people are hungry and they're pulling it out of them. So if you just get right in there and then just pull, just tug in the spirit and just get everything that God has for you. Because he has a word, anointed word from the Lord this morning. And we just want you to feel so at home. I just want you to feel comfortable. You know, your kids, why don't you handsome, three handsome sons of the Wallace Bunch. Can you guys just stand up? These are amazing. Talk about dance moves. I mean, these guys can dance. We saw them in action last night. And, hey, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You said three handsome sons and only two stood. One of them ugly or what? what? <laughs> <laughs> We're just so glad to have them here. And, you know, I just think before they preach, I think it would be good if we just stand and just um, stretch our hands towards the Wallace family. Yes, and say, welcome to the family. Yes, welcome to the family. Welcome to the Idaho family, too. God is good. Lord Jesus, I just want to thank you for miracles. I want to thank you for bringing Natasha into Yaden's life. Lord, she was what we prayed for. She's what we, inter we were interceding for Yaden. And God, you showed up in such a beautiful way. And I just thank you, God, that you're going to bless their marriage, Jesus. I thank you for families that come together and join each other and we're, we're just going to go after our children. All of you in this room, I want you to know that we're going to go after our children. Every Wednesday, we have a, a huge notebook, and we have names and grandkids and sons and daughters. And if you don't have your kids' names in there, get it in there because things are happening. Kids are coming back to the Lord. They're serving God again. They're coming back to the house of the Lord. And it's just an amazing thing to pray for your kids. This church believes in children. And we're going to go after our children in the name of Jesus. The devil's not going to have Amen. any of them Amen. in the name of Jesus. It's for generation to generation. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that there's going to be freedom in this pulpit this morning. Jeff, you have total freedom in this pulpit. I thank you, God, that... We're going after your will, your kingdom come, your will be done in this place today. And we thank you for the anointing. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. It's all about your presence, Jesus. And I just thank you, Lord, that you just settle in on us, God. We worship you. We don't take it for granted, God. We thank you for your presence, Jesus. And I just think, turn to the person next to you and tell them that you're glad they're here today. And we're just going to hand this over. Hand the baton. Can I say something? Yes. Yeah, you're on Don't you go anywhere. You guys stay here. Oh, yeah, we will. Okay. I just want to say we're so glad to be here. You guys are amazing people. I mean, just in this area in general, we've just been blessed. Every time we go to the store or have to go anywhere, people are so kind and just... Um, outgoing and loving and we just feel your your just generous hearts 
Um, we had so many people helping last night. I don't even, I just want to say thank you because there are so many that I'm not sure exactly all who to thank personally, but it's just the spirit of this house, and you can tell that that's just in your hearts. And so we are honored to be here, and God has great timing. The last yeah. time we were here, it was Social Sunday as well. So, oh. yes. Yeah, so, we like to eat. <laughs> we like to eat. So, so yeah, so we are um, excited to hang out with you as well after service. So yes. God bless you all, and thank you for having us. Yes. Yeah. All right, so now, now let's just give a great big valley welcome to Pastor Jeff Wallace. Yes. Yeah. Stay. Thank you, guys. Thank you for such a gracious welcome and. You know, we are, we are family, you know, and Teresa and I were here a year ago, and we felt as though we were family even then. Um, and there's some more I want to share with that as we go, but because we're family, it just wouldn't be the same that you would have us come up and, and greet us and welcome us the way you did and then pray for us without us returning. And if I could have my sons come up and put their hands on Norm and Ruby. Thank you, Jesus. Dana, Shane, and everybody that's back there, if you just surround Norm and Ruby, because there's a great work that is going on in this house. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in this precious couple. We thank you, God, that they would carry this mantle and that they would hold on to this mantle until you say it's time for transition. We thank you, God, that they've been faithful, and we thank you that the support of this congregation is behind them 110%. They support their every decisions. We pray a blessing and more anointing. Norm and Ruby, your work is actually not done. The Father says the best years are still to come. <laughs> And so we thank you, God, for Lynn, Renee. Let your comfort be with them in this season. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now let's give a big old shout of praise to Jesus. Hey, Jordan, come here. Elijah, come here. Come here, Jeff. You guys, you guys can pick on Jordan. This is the one that wasn't there when Renee said for the three men to stand up. Turn around. Jordan generally is not a big fan of being in front of a crowd, but now he knows this is what happens when you dip out during the church service. <laughs> now he's asking me, he's like, are we good? Are we done? Should we have him just sit right here up front and stare at all of you today? Thanks, guys. Praise God. You know, I got to just, I want to encourage you with... Um, the sensitive spirit that I, it's just, that's what the Lord wants you to know. That there is truly a sensitive spirit in this house. And a hunger and a thirst um, in this house. In, I'm just going to go ahead if you don't mind. I'm just going to grab some more Kleenex right now. Because when you get, when you get in the presence of God. When you are open to what daddy wants to do, you receive his embrace. And there's something comforting about knowing when your father loves you so much that he will embrace you when it's good and he will embrace you when it's bad. Where I'm going with that is as I was standing over here, I just absolutely was drawn in with the worship. Well done, worship team. I was just drawn in, and I could do nothing but weep. Is it okay if a man stands before the throne of God and say, I could do nothing but weep in his presence? You know, I, I, I really just want to encourage Valley members 
that there's still room and God is bringing more out of your faithfulness to his throne. Do you receive that today? Can you see it today? You know, when a word is thrown out, it, it's, it's one of two things will happen. You will grab it and you'll receive it. Or maybe it's just not that time where you should grab it. Or maybe you're just not there yet where you understand what's being thrown. But if you do understand it, will you do me a favor? Just grab a hold of that word. But don't just hold on to it. See it coming into pass. I see these seats being filled. Because of a great work that has been started here years ago. And God gave Brother Rutson a vision. And he gave him a vision according to his will, to, according to God's will. And Brother Rudson was faithful. And I'm still thrilled to see the model that you've put together uh, before you actually... Uh, you and some of the members here actually erected and constructed this beautiful facility. But that vision and all of these seats, God gave him that vision because these seats should be filled with the souls that Jesus is drawing towards him. I just need some people to gather around us and see these seats being filled. Why don't we see two services on Sunday morning? Okay, now I'm getting a little bit crazy, huh? Why don't we just do like old tent revival stuff and just, just hang out here all day. You guys like to eat. Why don't we go from uh, social Sunday once a month to four times a month. And we'll just come on eat in the presence of God and then, and then hang out out here in this beautiful field and campus and play softball and volleyball. I was looking for the volleyball pit. Not that I should or could play the game. But I like to cheer God's people on. Well, we had a lot of fun yesterday, as my wife mentioned, and uh, I, we are now family. How many of you guys know that song? We are family. <laughs> Go ahead, sing it. Okay, okay, Lynn, we found them. We know where they are. We should pray for them right now, listening to that kind of music. <laughs> and all these, Christy Lynn. Dancing up a storm last night, and I thought, oh, dear Jesus, we should really pray for her. But just kidding. But then she's up here, she's up here dancing before the Lord like no other, man. Come on, somebody, give her a shout. I loved it. Loved it. I got to tell you, this really reminds me, you know, uh, give you a little history about us. My wife and I, uh, born, she was born in Spokane, and we were both raised in Spokane. Teresa was chasing me on the playground at St. Aloysius grade school. I know, I know. She chased me for a lot of years. She was so persistent that I said, okay. No, seriously, she was in first grade, and I was in third grade at the same school over in Spokane, Washington. And we grew. We, our families knew each other. We were just, just blocks away from each other, and it was great. It was a great experience. Went to the Catholic Church out there. Appreciate my parents and, and her parents, of course, for raising us up uh, the best way that they knew in that, in that time. Uh, we, we did receive some seeds, obviously, because God brought us into a path that we didn't anticipate. And so then we were, she was in high school, and I was out of school, and we got together, and, and next thing you know, we're married, and, and God is really just doing wonderful work. This is our oldest son, Jeff Jr., over here, who is single. And then uh, Natasha, who was just married last night. Jordan, wave your hand over here in the white hat, the one that snuck out. I'm just going to keep pointing him out today. And then his younger but taller brother, the tallest of all of them, Elijah, wave Elijah. So we have four beautiful kids. And, uh, you know, if I could just be transparent for a moment so you get an understanding of just really who I am. Um, I found myself in a whirlwind of addiction for 31 years. And my loving wife stayed with me, and she has this, this tattered Bible where she went to the throne on my behalf consistently. So then 11 years ago, I was so miserable with the life that I was leading that I, 
I wanted something different. How many of you ever wanted something different before in life? Where you just, you're just going along, and it, it's not like life is horrible or terrible. It's not like you want to take your life, but you just know that there's just got to be something coming. There's something different. Have you ever said, God, is this really all there is? Is this what I do? Do I clock in, clock out, go hang out with the guys, go hang out with the girls, and then wake up and do it again? Is that really all there is? Well, that's where I was. I was just miserable. I always held a good job or decent job and even better jobs, and I'd clock in, clock out. But my understanding of life was that's what you do. You, you get married, you have kids, and then you go hang out with the boys, and you join bowling leagues and pool leagues, and, and you're tipping them back and this and that. That's, that's really all I knew. And my heart was broken. It was absolutely torn because of the filth that I caught myself uh, in. And, and it was nothing. It was not on the radar. It wasn't part of the plans. And so I wanted to have a Bible study. I wanted something to change. Sometimes when you want something to change, you got to do some different things to get those results. And so I said, let's, let's do a Bible study and my numbers are 10 to 12. My wife was up here telling the story. It'd be 8 to 10. We wanted 10 to 12 people to come over on Friday night, and we just wanted a Saturday night. See, I got to look at her when I'm telling these stories. Uh, on Saturday nights, and we just wanted to have some food and some fellowship, and we wanted to listen to worship and play some games and just read the Bible. And... God had a different plan because a couple of months in, we found ourselves getting rid of all of our furniture because we didn't have enough room to seat all the people that were coming to our home. Three to four months in, there's now 80, 90, 80 to 90 people consistently coming into our tiny little duplex up, up in North Spokane. I remember this one specific day, the kids used to play out in the the playground across the street, the kids' elementary school was across from us, and, and my wife would take them over, and they'd play kickball, but before she had taken them over, there was this one time where, have you, have you guys seen the movie, what's the Kevin Costner movie, Field of Dreams? Build it, they will come? Remember all the cars at the end of that show that were coming to the, that's really what it was like in my neighborhood, and my wife and I are looking out the blinds going, where are these people coming from? There was a gentleman that came from, we're in Spokane, Washington, there was a gentleman that came from uh, St. Mary's, Idaho, because he had heard the, the, the social networking then was MySpace. <laughs> How many of you remember MySpace? Okay, all right. A young guy in the back said, yeah, I, that was MySpace. And so God was bringing 80 to 90 people every Saturday. So let me backtrack just a few. In the midst of launching this small group, I had an encounter with Jesus. My wife and I were holding hands and on our knees, and one who used to be my partner in crime, my older brother, who had become my partner in Christ, he came and he prayed for me with a neighbor that operated in the prophetic. And, it, and they came to our house, and in the middle of this Bible study, they prayed for us and they put their hands on us. And I was so broken and so miserable. That I remember saying, okay, Jesus, if this is real, I believe. Well, I went to work the next day being the skeptic that I was. I tried to test that little prayer, and I walked into the, the circle where everybody was smoking cigarettes, and, and I went and I asked for a cigarette. And at the stench of somebody else's cigarette that was smoking nearby... I about lost all my cookies. And in that moment, I knew that I had radical deliverance of Jesus Christ. And it's been 11 years now. Haven't gone back, haven't looked back, not even interested. And I'm, I'm thankful the, the next transition would be that we, would, we joined a church. That, that small group grew to be about 110 people. And there was a church planted on north, Sp north side of Spokane. Our pastor at that time sent us out to Moses Lake after we were with him two and a half, three years. Sent us out to Moses Lake to take over a Christian school that was there. Wasn't doing all that well. 
financially it was was in debt it was the the facility it was just tor horrible so it was our first mission field really when we went out and restored the school and God brought families and, and next thing you know we have a waiting list in the school everything's turned around got to God be the glory and and we planted a church and the church was absolutely amazing uh, we were blessed with a beautiful piece of property and had two full services on Sunday morning and a standing room only midweek service Jeff was our youth pastor he had 50 60 kids coming every Friday night coming from the public schools in Moses Lake to be a part of what he was doing on Friday night Natasha my daughter was the worship leader with the boys and and Jeff on as vocals and and it was absolutely a phenomenal work but here's here's where I'm going with that entire story God put me in that journey in the lifestyle and all those choices that I never anticipated living out he put me in that so that when I got to Moses Lake which is a very diverse community but at the same time because it's central Washington a lot of drug trafficking human, tra human trafficking and all of those things were going on in Moses Lake so our church looked like that community God took me through those things so that when I came to Moses Lake, I wouldn't look down my nose at anybody that was struggling with addiction or prostitution or whatever it may be, but I, that I would go to Moses Lake to the best of my ability with my hands, just like Jesus' hands, and that I would receive these people as Jesus would receive these people. These people came in and we saw souls being, being brought to the kingdom and we saw people being freed from addiction. We saw people that were broken now have hope we saw their future was turning and changing and God did a great work and then all of a sudden there was a shift we were excited about Moses Lake here's this ex-drug addict and alcoholic finally given an opportunity to do something really great and impact other people's lives and there were decisions made that were really unknown to us it was just a suddenly have anybody ever experienced a suddenly where where you just out of nowhere you just get hit with some stuff some circumstances and trials and troubles and all those things that were warned of in the scripture but sometimes we just read them and we just really don't believe them and we think hey I'm a Christian life should just be peachy that's a lie say that's a lie Look at your neighbor say, you brought me here. I just found out that's a lie. <laughs> well, it wasn't a peachy circumstance. And I had been teaching out of the story of David, 1st and 2nd Samuel, just about how loyal David was. Not perfect, but how loyal David was to the throne of God. And to those that God would call into his life to lead him, Saul. Here's Saul trying to kill him. Here's David who has the opportunity to take his life. He snips his collar and it smites his heart. Why? Because he touched God's anointed. So in this transition, I had to make sure that my heart was right before the Lord we didn't know what was next we absolutely didn't know what was next and it was and it was there's was, there's was fear and trembling when you just don't anybody ever been there it, it's just you just don't know everything is just absolutely unknown to us in our tomorrows and for some reason we get ourselves out there and we try to get those blueprints in advance from God so we can have it easy God's going no this is where I want to equip you so he was equipping us because we didn't know what was next we knew there was transition coming but we didn't know where we didn't know how we didn't know what to do so here's what we chose to do we had our regional direct which was pastor Gordon Banks many of you were at the wedding yesterday pastor was there and he and his wife came up and did the communion and the blessing with Natasha and Yaden a wonderful man wonderful woman just great 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 integral shepherds and so we counseled with them and here's what pastor gordon said <clears throat> i'll never remember this and then we'll transition in today's message and we'll get you out of here in about three hours what time are we eating <laughs> oh oh noon i heard noon so we'll take a break at noon and we'll come back and finish up 
So Pastor Gordon said, this is what you have to do, Jeff. He says, you have to let go of your home. He says, you have to encourage the people, but you have to let go of the people. He says, you have to let go of the city. They will be fine. He said, you and your wife brought hope to those people. Encourage them. And then God will show you what's next. But not until then will God show you. So the title of today's message is Positioned for Transition. Is there anybody here believing for some things in your future? Has God shown you that, honestly, hey, hey, let me just tell you, I ask a lot of questions. Don't raise your hand because I'm asking you a question. Raise your hand because God sees your heart. Is there anybody here believing? Anybody here that has been shown some things and you want those things to come to pass? Many of you have been maybe taking, keep your hands up, walking step by step with Jesus And every once in a while, there's this stirring and this frustration in your heart. You're going, what? I'm doing everything you've asked me to do. And it gets a little bit frustrating and it's troubling. And how many of you, if, raise your hand. Papa sees your heart. Scripture says the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro across the whole earth, seeking whose heart is loyal to him. So when our our loving pastors ask the question, just remember, they're not asking because they need to see. I'm sorry, but they are absolutely phenomenal people. But the transformation comes from the king. So they're throwing some seed out there, and it is absolutely up to you to participate with what God is doing. Participation is key. Say participation is key. Oh, you guys said it better than I did. Positioned for transition. We're going to look at um, our main text, and we're just going to highlight some things in this text, which really kind of fall in line with what I'm sharing with you today. I like this little setup we got here. I really do. This is, this is really actually kind of cool. I'm kind of an all-over preacher. You know, Yaden and Natasha experienced a level of transition yesterday. And we've observed them position themselves rightfully so before the throne of God. And they did everything according to his counsel with friends and family, which led to this day, this wedding day where they became one. Now guess what? Now they're one. And now there's a new transition. So we, as the, the, the family, the family of God, we've got to encourage them Maybe more so in the day that we're living, not by so, many, so much word, but more by action. We've got to encourage them to keep it real in this new transition, in this new season, and to continue doing all the things that they've done before because God has great things for Yaden and Natasha. Let's jump in. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use all New Living Translation today, and we're going to go to Jeremiah 29. How many of you guys remember Jeremiah 29, 11? How many of you say... Quote that scripture often. Can we just kind of take a look at the verses before it and get an understanding why in this letter Jeremiah said what he said in verse 11? So why don't we just go ahead and start in verse 1. Jeremiah, and, and let me just tell you right now, I did not do any seminary school. So if I hack up the names here, Just give me some grace. Say grace. Okay, I'm going to walk in. I'm going to step into that now. Jeremiah wrote a letter from Jerusalem to the elders, priests, prophets, and all the people who had been exiled to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. This was after King Jehoiakim, the queen mother, the court officials, the other officials of Judah, and all the craftsmen and artisans had been deported from Jerusalem. He sent letter with Elasa, son of Shaphan, 
and Jemariah, son of Hilkiah, when they went to Babylon as king, Zedekiah's ambassadors to, to Nebuchadnezzar. Here we go. This is what Jeremiah's letter said. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Here, let's highlight these. He says, build homes, plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the fruit, they, the fruit they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply. Do not dwindle away. Work for peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it and for its welfare will determine your welfare. See, sometimes we see things on the horizon and we start running for the horizon. Can I encourage you that if you don't get things right, right where you are, you're going to drag everything that you're in here to there. Say, get it right. Look at your neighbor and say, I told you. <laughs> so where we are at, where the exiles were, you can really honestly give this connotation to it that Jeremiah was trying to reconcile them to their captivity. That they were to make the best of where they were. Other translations really very clearly point that God caused it all to happen. Why? So he can mature them in the process. So he can grow them in the process. So whatever's troubling, in, troubling you or whatever's hindering you, whatever's lying to you about what's coming for you, you've got to take a look at you. Maybe a different perspective. Somebody asked me over on the west side. They're going through some hard times and, and troubles at work and troubles in ministry and they just never felt like they were getting to the next level and, and they... They, can I use the word vomit? They pretty much can't. I just did, didn't I? Okay, no visuals. Don't put any visuals to that. But they pretty much came in and just put some stuff on my desk. And I sat, as pastors do often, and listened, and listened some more, and listened some more, and listened some more. And then the gentleman asked me, he said, Will this ever change? And then he started to put some more on my desk after he asked me the question. It was one of those, will it ever change? And then he cut me off. And he went on, he went on, he went on. And, 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 and I said, okay, hey, uh, young man. I said, here's what I need you to do. I said, I need you to stop because you asked me a question, but you haven't heard my answer. Okay, well, will it ever change? And I said, yes, all of it will change. When you change. Why is it we want everything and everyone else around us to change, but not us? I mean, because we are living such a clean and holy life. Why is it we want our spouse to change, but we're not willing to change? Why do we want our boss to change, but yet we haven't changed? Can I encourage you with a little something? If you have given your life to Jesus Christ and confessed that he is Lord over your life, the change starts with you. We are supposed to be different than what it looks like in our community. I think there's this really cool book that says we are supposed to be salt and Oh, you guys read the same book. <laughs> we are called to be salt and light. So wherever we are, whatever's troubling us, we need to find ourselves being productive. Say, so settle down, antsy pants. <laughs> Let's get ourselves to a productive place right where we are. The exiles were called to provide for themselves. 
I guess you could say that God had given them everything that they would need. But because their perspective was skewed, they wanted to go. They wanted, and, I, and I get it. I get it. I get it. I, I understand what it's like to be bound and wanting to be free. I get it. But what God's showing them here through this letter is you can be free anywhere you go. Why? You have Jesus. You have Jesus. You can walk in that freedom wherever you go. They're to find and bring. Find and bring. Find and bring. Say find, bring, peace wherever I go. So they were, they were told to pray for peace. Seek it. Pray for it. And not just for yourself, but in the environment, in the city, in the country, in the region that you are in. Pray for it. It's what Papa's encouraging them to do through Jeremiah. So now let's look at the results once they do that. This is what the Lord of Heaven's army, the God of Israel, says. Do not let your prophets and your fortune tellers who are with you in the land, Babylon, trick you. Do not listen to their, their dreams because they are telling you lies in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. Be careful in your trials and your troubles and when things are pushing against you at where you're seeking your advice. It's okay to go to friends, and I would strongly encourage that before you go to friends or Facebook. That you would come and honor the men and women of God that he's called to walk with you. These are very integral, loving people. They're raising up a team of leaders that have been entrusted to help carry the work. Because there's a lot of people out there God bless them. We love them. No stones. Not throwing any stones in them. But there's a lot of people out there that want to tell you what to do. Thus says the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my cat died. Well, I feel like the Lord's saying that your little kitten's going to have eight more lives. <laughs> oh, you're brilliant. Come to your pastor's. And even if you go to a friend, because there are solid friends, we have solid friends, and, and your friends encourage you, uh, thus says the Lord, do me a favor, check with the Lord. He really has the blueprints, correct? I mean, sometimes you got to wonder, it's like, why would he show you my blueprints, but not me? We're going to have a lot of friendship fights. Your, your office is going to be really, really busy. Watch this. Here's the results. Verse 10, this is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for seven years. He told them how long. He'll tell you how long. For 70 years. It's all his timing. He says, but then... I will come and do some. Is that what I said? All? Oh, I'm sorry. I, there's something wrong with my computer. Come and do all the good things I have promised. Watch this. What does it say next? Help me read this last. And you guys over here sound really good. Much grace. Let's. Let's read it again. What's it say? I will bring you home again. Show off. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> Louie. That's right. God bless you, Louie. And, Plug you know, I'm, I'm really not setting him up like I was setting my boy, Jordan, up. I love your heart. You've got a very transparent heart before God. And I want to thank you for that. You're a great example of what it's like with when men worship. Continue that. Men of God, let this be a great example of us living in freedom. Jesus.
There's nothing wrong with a man getting out of his comfort zone. Stay here, Louie. There's nothing wrong with a man getting out of his comfort zone in the presence of the Almighty. If I could have the men stand up. Men of God, it is our time. You are another one. Well done. And all of you, well done. This is not correction. This is encouragement. That we are living in a season where we have to receive and walk in the freedom that Jesus Christ has given us. Because let me just tell you something. When the heart of the house, when the heart of your home shifts and you allocate and dedicate yourself to the king, that environment shifts. And it's not until then does this environment shift. If you want a crazy shift in this house, start with your house. When the heart of this house shifts, then you shift a community. When you shift a community, the house is full. Brothers, Jesus didn't come to set us free so we can live how we want. He came to set us free so we would live how we should. You grab that, men of God? Do you grab that, men of God? Men of God, put your hand on another man of God. Come here, bro. You're with me. <laughs> Louie. Oh. How you doing? My name's Jeff. I'm Louie. <laughs> Father God, we thank you for the shift in the hearts of the men in this house and this community. We thank you, God, that they would lead, that they would be the lights, that they would be the example, that they would have a desire like never before to chase after you, to dance before your throne, to worship you like never before. Father, shift this city with these men. And we thank you for it in advance. In Jesus' mighty and majestic name, all of his men said, Amen. Amen. Give God a hand. (laughs) Mama, you're going to have to help me with the time. What time are we supposed to eat? Okay. Praise God. He will bring you home again. Let's not let's not solely attach that, correlate that with a tangible place and leave out the fact that he might bring you back to a place where you were once dancing before his throne. Mind, spirit, soul. You know, my wife and I really loved our assignment in Moses Lake. And Papa showed me while I was studying this for you that he's going to bring me back to that place where we can really enjoy, really enjoy, really enjoy what we are doing all for his glory. So it's not just a location. But it could be a, an emotion or a spiritual thing, something in your soul, something in your mind, something. Rest for our minds, Jesus. And then let's read this verse 11 together. Go ahead. New King James uses thoughts. For I know the thoughts that I have for you. Papa God is thinking of you. His thoughts for you, what he has 
already drawn out, what he has already sketched out for you is good. Done. No questions asked. When will we get to this place as the body of Christ where we quit whining and complaining? Can I just be real, just for a second? Where we quit whining and complaining, why? Because the scripture that we stand on as believers says everything from today forward is good. Our future is good. It's not, it might look like it. Get above it. Get above it because that's not true. That's a lie. Get yourself above it because what God is doing for you as he did for the exiles, it's all good. Say, it's all good. Let me run through some scriptures for you real quick. And then I want you to just quickly write these down. And then you've got to develop this in your spirit on your time. Say, I'll read the word. Psalms 37, 23. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will never fall. For the Lord holds them by the hand. Write down Proverbs 16, 9. We can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Why do we get frustrated when our plans don't work out? Proverbs 20, 24. The Lord directs our steps, so why try to understand everything along the way? Hello. Come on, somebody do this with me. I should have read the word. <laughs> Remember the old, should have had a V8? No, no, should have read the word. So if God would direct our steps, why wouldn't we check with him more often on which way we should go? Proverbs 3 says, acknowledge him in some of your ways. There's Louis over here, look at him. Louis like, whatever. <laughs> says, acknowledge him in all of your ways. Not just the major decisions. All of them. Now, I'm not talking about should we eat at Burger King or Wendy's. <laughs> if I may say, you probably shouldn't eat it either. <laughs> Only God knows. His counsel for our lives are for him to know and for us to seek. In order for a good transition to take place, you have to know where you are. You ever been to a very large mall and they have these signs where uh, directories and you can go up and it, it tells you first you are here and then gives you some schematics or some little plans as to where you're trying to get? Okay, spiritually... For us to have a good transition forward, for us to move forward, we really have to take a look at where we are. Okay? So, uh, 2 Corinthians 13. Paul here is giving advice to the church in Corinth. And it's his third visit and another warning to the church. But check out verse 5. It says, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. I honestly could just stop. I could stop right here. We could pray. And I could encourage God's people, just go away. And just examine, evaluate your own heart. Quit trying to get that speck out of your neighbor's eye. Start chiseling on that plank hanging out of your own. And evaluate, is your faith genuine? Because a lot of people raise their hands as to what God is going to do for them in their tomorrows. Do you have the faith for that to come to pass? If you have the faith for that to come to pass, why are you worrying today? My wife and I walked this journey out with Yaden. We were so excited for him. My daughter said, Dad, are you going to cry? Because as you see, when the Spirit's moving and when everything's right in alignment with God, hey man, I'm a weeper, and I'm okay with that. 
But I told her no. I said, I don't think so. Why? Because seven years ago when I met Yaden, God showed me that he was going to be Natasha's husband. Why would I cry? Now, there could be tears of joy, which there was a glimpse of them yesterday. But I was truly excited. And I didn't like the battle in the last seven years because there were a lot of guys that wanted to date my daughter. And there had to be a lot of no's. One wanted to marry her. One of the hardest decisions as a father was to look at this man and say, no, I'm sorry. My faith had to be genuine that God showed me seven years ago who her husband was going to be. And I didn't even really probably receive it as a thus says the Lord, but I do remember walking into the house and looking at my family and saying, I think I just met Natasha's husband. Come on. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test you. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. I'm going to give you three points as we start to wind down. Who's on the keys? Can I get somebody on the keys? Come on up, Jeff. Jeff. <laughs> Jeff's like, not a chance. Three steps. Here's three quick steps to position yourself for a good transition. <sighs> know the position you are in. Now, not a seat, not a house, but the state or the health of your heart towards Jesus. Evaluate the state you are in. Watch this. Because the transition that's going to take place for the king He's looking at whose hearts are loyal to him. I want to believe. This is not infallible information, just subjective. I'm just, this is what I believe. I believe that we're moving into a season where we will truly see those of genuine faith advanced and positioned in his kingdom. Now, that's not bad. I'm not trying to be, bring bad news for anyone. What that means on the other side is that we're just going around a mountain again. How many of you like going around the mountain? Raise your hands. Come on. Come on. Anybody else like going around the mountain? Nobody likes going around the mountain. So I believe that this is the season where if you evaluate the state, the position, the health of your heart, is it in alignment with the throne of God? So an example. If you're having a rough time in your workplace, what do you do? Are you like Jesus? Are you like David, who we mentioned earlier? Are you like Ruth? Is it spiritual? Because there's a contrast, isn't there? Is it, is it grumbling? Is it complaining? For God to transition you, you've got to get to a place where you're still. where you're calm. I want you to see with me the Israelites. When Moses was leading them out. And they get to the point of the Red Sea. What are you doing? Did you lead us here to die? The scripture actually points in that text that they were in a panicked situation. Their perspective was skewed out of their panic. 
What did Moses say to them? Be still. Be still. You've got to know your position. Christy Lynn. Do you guys generally do a worship at the end? Can you pull your team up here and let's, let's get into a, a place of we're going to worship and pray. Okay? And, and, and we're going to...